So we're continuing in our sermon series from uh, the book of 2 Timothy, the last letter that Paul wrote um, before he uh, was killed. Um, and, and in 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 1, we come across what is arguably the key verse of the whole letter. Uh, 2 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 1, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I, th- I think that sentence right there, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, I think this, more than anything else, captures the big idea of the whole letter, the whole reason for Paul getting a pen to write his, fr- his friend, his spiritual son, Timothy, uh, what was that he might encourage him, that he might strengthen him through these words. Um, as we saw earlier in this sermon series, from an earthly standpoint, standpoint Timothy was in way over his head. Uh, I mean, humanly speaking, he was hopelessly unfit for the responsibilities being thrust upon him. Uh, for one thing, he's still quite young, um, something I, I can relate to as a young pastor. Uh, but more than being young, Timothy is prone to illness. Uh, he seems to be timid by temperament. More than, more than once, multiple times, Paul has to uh, tell him not to be afraid or, or ashamed or timid. Um, it seems that, uh, that, that Paul is young, he's frail, he's timid, and yet huge responsibilities are being thrust upon him. Paul, this great apostle to the Gentiles, knows the end is near, and in a sense he's passing the baton to his spiritual son, um, kind of challenging him to, to, to continue to teach and, and propagate and declare uh, the gospel. And so he writes to encourage him, to embolden him. Though he might be tempted, though Timothy might be tempted to shrink back from fear, to feel overwhelmed, to to give up or throw in the towel, Paul writes that Timothy might be strengthened. And so this key sentence is, is be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Everything else in the letter hinges on that exhortation. And I want to just on this point, on this sentence, I want to make three quick observations. Uh, the first is that be strong is an imperative, uh, which is to say that be strong is a command. This is not like a suggestion. This is not like a wish. I hope that you're strong, or, you know, I want to encourage you to think about potentially being strong. Um, it, it's, it's a command. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. A second, be strong, is in the present tense, which in English is a little bit different, but in the Greek, uh, the present tense uh, denotes continual action. So so this is essentially be continually strengthened, not a singular once for all, like you're strong and then you're good for life. Uh, We know that's not how the spiritual life works. This process of being strengthened is something that needs to be renewed every day. It's it's a challenge, it's a command. Daily, find your strength in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And so so first, it's a command. Second, it's a present tense, continual command. Third, it's a passive command, uh, which is a way of saying, he's not saying strengthen yourself, but he's saying be strengthened. It's a passive verb implying that he can't do this himself that he is not the source of his own strength. This is a strength that he finds in Christ Jesus. Um, This is not a a message of, you know, dig down deep, you know, pull yourselves up from from your bootstraps. You know, you've got it in you. I believe in you, Timothy. You have what it takes. It's not what Paul is saying. He's saying you don't have what it takes, but Christ does, so find your strength in him. Be supplied by his grace. And I think when he he gets at this, you know, that you are to be strengthened, be continually strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Um, What he means is, you know, by means of the grace, that is your your source. He's he's pointing Timothy to a a continual state of active dependence. I remember a number of years ago being at a conference, and depending on God was the subject of a particular talk. I remember a lady in the front row who, who kind of raised her hand and kind of said very matter-of-factly, like, 
I depend on the Lord for everything that I do. And, and it wasn't the, the setting for like a debate or like getting into the nitty gritty with her, but I couldn't help but in my mind, I, I, I want to make a distinction between two things, because, between like a theological knowledge, like recognition that ultimately my very existence depends on God. Like I wouldn't be here, like he is, I'm being sustained by him, like theologically, I get that. And you can, you can maintain a knowledge that ultimately all things depend on God. That is something that you can maintain, you know, like, oh, d- d- do you know that? Yes, I know that. But that's not quite what Paul is getting at here. Like theologically understand that the, the, the true source of strength is in Christ Jesus. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, actually find your strength in that. Like, it's one thing to know objectively that we have to depend on God. It's another to consciously, actively be depending on him. Um, I, I think one of the ways to think about this is, like, if, if I were to tell you next Sunday you're preaching the sermon, um, I would imagine that that would induce panic attacks for a number of people in this room. Um, you, you, would, you would start sweating. You would start freaking out. Um, you, you'd be tempted to move out of Massachusetts entirely. Um, but, but, but as I think back on my first preaching experiences, I can tell you there is like a present active dependence when you're doing something for the first time and especially when it's in front of people and, and, and you're kind of freaking out you know, like, every word, like, God, I need you. Like, like that is active dependence. Like, I am going to completely make a fool of myself if you do not show up. Jesus, I need your grace right now. And I'd imagine that all of us have had these kinds of moments where you're like, as I just talked about with parents, you're leaving the hospital. Good Lord, I need your help. Like, this, this present active, conscious awareness of I cannot do this on my own. We have moments of that, but preserving that doesn't come naturally to any of us. Because once you've done something five times, 10 times, 25 times, 150 times, I mean, think of something you do in your job, like 25 times a day, you know, five, six days a week, and you've been doing it for years. Like, once you kind of get something, like, I've got this thing figured out, like, I, I, I figured this out, it is tempting to, to start doing it like, I've got this, I can do this, and you kind of lose this present, conscious, active dependence. That's something that needs to be continually, like, fostered and reminded. It doesn't come naturally. Nobody naturally depends on God for something that they think they've got figured out already. And this is, so this is something that, um, that, that, that is, is needed whether you're a pastor, and I need to fight the temptation to be like, oh, you know, I've, I've, I've preached my share of sermons. I, I don't know how many it is at this point, but, I, you know, I've, I've, I've done my you know, hundreds of sermons. I've got this thing figured out. I've got this God. Good night. Like that spells the end of this church when I start coming up on a regular basis. Like I got this thing, God, you know, you know, booyah. Like, and, and I try to go like in my own knowledge and strength. And, and there are pastors that do that. And it's tempting to do that. I've done enough of this. I've got it figured out. And if that's tempting in ministry when you're up front, I just know how much more so in everyday life, in parenting. Like, day one, you get it. But when you've, you know, wiped the, 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 a butt 500 times, when you've changed diapers, five, when you've done all these things, you're kind of like, yeah, I got this, yeah, they'll be okay, whatever. And you can get really lax and really disconnected from this kind of Godwardness, this prayerfulness, this active, conscious dependence. That's what Paul is calling Timothy to do. Find your strength continually in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Notice how grace is being used there. Uh, Grace, oftentimes when we think of grace, we think of or we equate it to forgiveness. Um, You know, that that, that grace is that thing that that canceled my, my sin. John Piper, in his book, Future Grace, makes clear, he says, By grace, I do not mean merely the pardon of God in passing over your sins, but also the power and beauty of God to keep you from sinning. 
So, so grace is not merely forgiveness. Grace is empowerment. Grace is strength. Uh, that word grace refers to unmerited favor, an undeserved gift. Um, I don't know if you've heard the acronym G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, basically, like God's riches purchased for us through Christ's death on the cross is grace. When God extends anything to us other than wrath, it is grace. Grace is not merely forgiveness. It is empowerment. Grace covers and grace strengthens. Grace saves, but it also changes and transforms and supplies what we need. Grace is power to live the Christian life, power to learn and grow, power to rise up and press on, power to persevere and overcome. Whatever obstacle is standing in your way, whether that's temptation, some temptation that threatens to derail you, or some hardship that threatens to overwhelm you, or, or, or some you know, second-rate blessings or, or good things of God that threaten to become idols for you that, that you, that you kind of push God out of the way in order to focus too much on you know, the, this thing. Whatever it is, we need grace. We need divine enabling power to, 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 to supply what our hearts and head and hands need to press on in obedience. And so Paul describes four Christian callings, I could say, um, in, this, in this section that are only made possible when we are actively, continually finding strength in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Four things that, that on their own, if we try to do in our own strength, we will fail miserably. Like we are not equipped and cut out, just as Timothy wasn't, four callings that none of us can live up to apart from grace. But with grace, f- these four different callings become possible. They become doable. Uh, We are called to be spiritual teachers, spiritual soldiers, spiritual athletes, and spiritual farmers. Um, And as we look at this, I don't want us to view these as four separate callings, like like Andy is called to be a spiritual farmer, and -and so-and-so, you know, uh, Nick is called to be a spiritual athlete, and, you know, Dan is called to be a spiritual soldier, like as as if, you know, we're we're all, like, having given these individual separate callings, but but all four of these, teacher, soldier, athlete, farmer, are four different aspects of of callings that God uh, asks of each of us. Four things that on their own would be impossible for us, but with grace, they become possible. So these are four overlapping callings. And and as we see, I I think the first teacher is primary and and kind of most clearly explains the what we are to do. And the other three are kind of subordinate and explain how we are to do it. So I, I think to some extent, and I'll modify this in a second or explain it in a second, but to some extent we are all called to be teachers um, in, in, in some way, and, and how we go about doing that is modified by our calling to be athletes and soldiers and farmers. That changes how we go about this teaching process. So I, I want to explain each of these, these metaphors. So first, we are called to be spiritual teachers. Look at verse 2. And the, great, and the things you have heard me say... In the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So he's writing to Timothy. He spent, you know, he says in verse one, you then my son. So he's writing to someone who has spent a ton of time with him. They've kind of worked, labored side by side together for years. You then my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, do something with that. Entrust this truth, entrust this knowledge to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. The picture here of this this teaching, this entrusting, the picture is not of like auditoriums and large audiences. The picture is much more personal than that. Here Paul tells Timothy to pass along the truth that he's heard from Paul to reliable men who can then uh, teach others and keep the chain going. Now, there, there are four generations of kind of passing truth along that are described here. We've got Paul, 
first, who's writing to Timothy. Timothy's supposed to teach reliable men. These reliable men should be qualified to teach others. And I don't think like it's supposed to stop there. Like after this fourth generation, Paul, Timothy, reliable men, others, like once you get there, then we're done. No, the, the, the picture here is, is this ongoing process where someone invests into you and you then invest and entrust the truth that you've heard, entrust that to someone else. Uh, this is typically what we have in mind when we talk about discipleship here at Calvary. Uh, hopefully, if you've been here for very long at all, you've heard uh, that language of discipleship come up. We would love to see everyone involved in some kind of discipleship relationship here at Calvary. And, and right now, there's not a lot of formal structure for that. We've done different things in, in the past. The emphasis in recent years has been on small groups and establishing more connections that way, but, but we've been doing some research behind the scenes. There's been a lot of, of work done in the last number of months, um, kind of brainstorming and discerning the best way to a, a little bit more visibly and formally encourage and facilitate discipleship taking place in the church. And so, uh, so hopefully there will be more formal steps and direction with this in the future. Um, but but we, don't, we don't expect every person here uh, to teach from the pulpit. You know, the, 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 the thought that you might be, you know, up next week is, is not going to happen. Um, we're, we're, we don't expect or anticipate everyone to be a preacher or even everyone to be a small group leader or teacher in, in a formal sense. But, but there is a responsibility for every believer to pass on what they've learned. Uh, we're, as, as we talked about earlier, we're not supposed to be cul-de-sacs, but conduits. Um, when God's grace comes to us, we're not supposed to just like hang on to that and it kind of ends there, but we're supposed to be people through which that grace, that truth gets passed on to others. So what Paul is saying is, I've invested in you, Timothy. Find some guys that you can invest into who will be people that can invest into others so that this chain continues. And the chain has continued for the last 2,000 years down to this present day. Uh, I, I, wouldn't that be incredible to see if you could follow your spiritual genealogy, your spiritual lineage? You know, I don't know if there's anyone here who's big into genealogies. Um, my, my wife's dad and family, they've done a lot of work tracing physical genetic heritage and how everyone's connected. Wouldn't that be incredible if you could trace all the way back to the apostles, how the truth has been passed on until it came to you. There's this unbroken chain from them to us. And, and, and Paul's desire is that that chain would continue. And each of us, whether we're given formal responsibility to teach in front of a large audience or not, every one of us is entrusted. We're entrusted with the gospel. And we're entrusted to pass on what we've learned, what we've experienced, what we know to be true, to find someone that we can pour that out into. I did some math a while back. Um, I was curious what kind of difference it would make um, if someone like, truly committed their life to evangelism versus committing their life to discipleship. And I thought to myself, what would be a like, profoundly successful evangelistic ministry? Uh, other than maybe some extreme examples like Billy Graham or things like that, I think, I think if any one of us like, was able to, to lead 50 people to Christ per year, I think we'd be like, that's pretty awesome, right? I, I think if, if I just used 50 converts a year, 50 people led to salvation in Christ every year because of your evangelistic efforts, I think we would be like rejoicing with you. I think that would be pretty fantastic. Uh, probably less than a handful of people in this room um, have ever led 50 people to the Lord their whole lives. So, so to say 50 in a year, I think, is, is a fairly lofty goal. And say you start when you're young, you persevere till, till you're old. Say for 45 years, you lead 50 people uh, to salvation in Christ. That would be a total of 2,250 converts. Uh, I, I wouldn't be ashamed of anyone having a lifelong ministry like that. But for how many people is that an attainable goal? Uh, I, I think for most of us, we'd say, not going to happen. <laughs> you know, as much as I want, I can pray, but realistically, that just seems so out of reach. Uh, 
But then I thought, what if instead of leading 50 people to faith a year, what if I committed myself to investing in one person for three years? One person at a time for three years, week after week, spending time with them, uh, creating a depth to the point that after three years, they may not be, uh, you know, some big, well-known leader, but after three years, I've invested in them enough that they, they might be able to go and meet with someone else. And if this multiplication process happened, which is what Paul is describing with Timothy, reliable men, teaching others, if that were to happen, one person for three years, so that after three years, that other person then meets with one person for three years, and you meet with one person for three years. And then after another three years, you know, there's now four people doing this. And if you were to compare 45 years invested in this, although you only personally would have discipled 15 people, there'd be a total of 32,768 mature, committed disciples as a result. So 2,250 at 50 people a year, which seems totally out of reach, and yet one person for three years, which I think most of us feel like, you know, I may not be a superhero, but I can spend three years just investing and getting to know and pouring my life into one person. Um, do that 32,768 at the end of your life. That's something to rejoice over and be proud of, and it's something that's doable. This is what Paul is calling Timothy to do, to keep this chain going. And you may not feel like, you might feel like you're a kindergartner in the faith. One of the things that I learned in college um, I remember going into my senior year feeling led by God and praying about who God might want me to invest into. I was thinking about different guys in my dorm and, and, and people, and as I was, I, I was praying, I was thinking, hadn't figured anything out, and while I'm in this season of praying, one of my friends came up to me, um, a guy who was maybe like six months younger than me. Um, he was in my, in my grade, and he came up and said, you know, Caleb, I've just been thinking about this. I wonder if you'd be willing to meet with me, if we could just get together and talk about our faith together. And I was like, like, it didn't even dawn on me. Like, I'm thinking of like, who are the spiritual babies that I might have enough knowledge to invest into? And here's this guy that's like, that I feel like is totally an equal. Um, and he comes and says, well, can we just talk about faith together? Would, would you meet with me? And, and as I look back on that experience of that year of meeting together, like, it, it was incredible, the changes that, that, what God was doing in his life through me. And I felt like if we were in a race, I felt like I was like five steps ahead of him. Like I'm barely ahead of him spiritually, but it was almost like I had more of an impact because of that. Like, like what I'm going through, he's about to go through. And what I just went through, he's going through now. It's like we were so close and yet God used that in a tremendous way in his life. And, and sometimes I think we feel like, oh, I'm not equipped enough. I don't know enough. And it doesn't have to be someone who's like way in your mind under you in their knowledge or experience. It can be someone who's just, you just rub shoulders with and say, hey, can we get together? Can we meet? Can we talk? And you just give your life, even if you don't feel like I have much to offer, at least let's just open the scriptures together. Let's read a book together. Let's talk about something together. That's something that all of us can do. And I want to encourage you to think about that because that, this is the primary calling that, that Timothy gets, this calling to be a teacher, to be a discipler. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men. This teacher metaphor comes first, and the next three, being a soldier, being an athlete, being a farmer, are in a sense explaining how we go about this task of teaching and discipling. So, 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 so the, the driving image is that we would take the mantle of discipleship, that we would take some ownership and start investing in people around us. Um, even if it's just one person, even if it's for three years at a time, that we would start somewhere. But then how should we go about that? Uh, we're, we're, we're told the second calling that we have are to be spiritual soldiers. Look at verses three and four. It says, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. So what we see with each of these next three metaphors, soldier, athlete, farmer, is some aspect of suffering and then some reward that's promised. There's some, some suffering, some reward. This, when he says, 
Um, in verse 3, endure hardship. I think this hangs over all three of these metaphors because every one of these, every soldier, athlete, farmer, they all suffer in some way. There's all hardship that they have to endure, but there's specific ways in which they endure hardship. So with each metaphor, we get some type of suffering and then some reward that's promised. And so first, we're, we're told that the hardship that a soldier endures is single-mindedness. Verse 4, no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. There is a single-mindedness to being a soldier, a, a concentration on what is most important that Paul asks of Timothy. As you go about discipling, be single-minded in this task, in your effort in this way. Um, when it says that, that no... Uh, No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. I'm not a big fan of the NIV's use of the word involved there. Um, I think it would be more accurately translated entangled. Um, It's a word that's used outside of the New Testament to uh, describe a sheep or a rabbit getting entangled in thorns. Uh, I think that's the picture that Paul has in mind. Not that you would like do anything that normal civilians would do, but that you wouldn't get entangled in that. You wouldn't get caught up in that. You wouldn't get bound up and held up by these things that are not your primary responsibility. Uh, the, the, the Christian life is not one of withdrawal from society. We're not called to this isolated monastic life. You know, I'm just going to hole up in a hut somewhere in the wilderness and, and just pray all day long. Um, so people throughout history have done that at, t- at times. That is not uh, the, the calling that Paul describes as if we need to like, be disconnected from every aspect of civilian life. Paul, in fact, was a tent maker, uh, which means that in order to sustain his ministry and not be dependent on every church for the funds to stay alive, he had a side job. He made tents, and he sold those tents, and he made some money. He, he, he did that on the side, not because he's getting entangled in civilian affairs, but because that made possible more work, more gospel ministry. And if he was in a place, and at times he was dependent on others, the Macedonians, the Philippians were churches that supported him, and there were missionary journeys and, and times when he may not have had that, the time and the resources to work on making tents, but when he needed to, he came back to this side job. So Paul doesn't have in mind like that you can't do anything regular people do, like you are separate from the world. That's not what he has in mind. But he's saying as you do the things of this world, don't get entangled, don't get caught up, entrapped, restricted by that. I think of uh, a passage that I preached on earlier this year, 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, We're going to look briefly at it, so turn uh, left in your Bibles just for a moment to 1 Corinthians 7. And I preached on this chapter um, at the end of my sermon series on marriage uh, when I I preached on singleness. And what does the Bible have to say about singleness? It's on our website if if that intrigues you and you want to learn more about that. But, um, but, But we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and uh And in verse 17, so 1 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, verse 17 is kind of the, one of the key themes in this chapter. So verse 17, he says, nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. So, so whatever your place in life, like be there, embrace that. But then he goes on to qualify that. Um, and, and explain that. He, he applies that to circumcision, um, which isn't as pressing an issue today, but was a pretty big deal then. Like, you know, if you're a Gentile and you become a, a Christian, do I need to be circumcised like the Jews? And so he's like, well, that, that doesn't really matter. What matters is keeping uh, God's commands. And then in verse 20 uh, to 24, he applies it to slavery. And because some people were slaves when they become Christians. And he makes clear, like, if you can become free, by all means, be free. But don't make the primary aim of your life be your earthly freedom. There's something more important even than your earthly freedom. Your primary calling in life is not to be free in any earthly sense. Because you're already Christ's slave. Your primary calling is to please him, to serve him, to love him. And if you can get free, by all means do it. 
But don't let that become your over, overarching ambition. Make your ambition Christ. And in verses 25 to 28, he continues this argument to, to remain in whatever state you are when you're called. And he applies it to marriage and singleness. If you're married, stay married. If you're single, single stay single. And then again, like, like slavery, he's like, if you don't want to be single, if you want to get married, you're free to get married. But don't make that the overarching ambition of your life. Like, your overarching ambition is Jesus Christ, pleasing Jesus Christ. And if you can do these things on the side, great, but this is, this is the aim. And, and I want you to look with me at uh, chapter 7, so 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29 to 31. He says, what I mean, brothers, is that the time is short. Like, we're not here forever. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it was not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. And so, so he's very aware that the time is short. This world is passing away. We don't have forever and, and people are going to face an eternity and heaven or hell. Like make our lives count. And so marriage, sorrow, happiness, owning things, using things, whatever it is, don't make those things primary. And I love how he says it in verse 31, which I think is the, the same idea that he's trying to communicate in 2 Timothy. Um, where he says, those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them. As if not engrossed in them. As if not entangled in them. As if not making them primary in your life. Don't be distracted by them. Don't let your stuff um, or your emotions control you or become idols that push Christ off the throne in your life. He is always primary. And then just a few verses later, he says to summarize in verse 35, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So whether you're slave or free, whether you're married or single, whatever situation you're in, the goal is how can you be as undivided in your devotion to the Lord as possible? It's the exact same thing that Paul is trying to communicate to Timothy. That, that no one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. They don't get entangled in those things. You've got to work. You've got to have a job. You've got to pay the bills. You've got to, you know, treat your husband or wife well. You've got to change diapers and take care of your kids. Like, there are things of this world that we just, for the sake of survival and propagating our species, like, there are things we've got to do, but don't make those things primary. Christ is primary. How can you be as undivided in your devotion? How can you be as single-minded like a soldier who strips away anything that is not absolutely essential? in order to focus on the task at hand. It's that single-mindedness that, that Paul wants Timothy to have as it comes to discipleship and entrusting to others the faith. Um, there, there, there's a, a wartime mentality, a, a single-mindedness. I appreciate um, in uh, John Piper's book, uh, Don't Waste Your Life, he quotes uh, from Ralph Winter, uh, a missiologist uh, who describes... Um, the, the, the Queen Mary, this uh, giant ship, um, and uses it as a vi vivid illustration between a wartime and a peacetime mentality. Now, this is Ralph Winter. He says, The Queen Mary, lying in repose in the harbor at Long Beach, California, is a fascinating museum of the past, used both as a luxury liner in peacetime and a troop transport during the Second World War. Its present status as a museum, the length of three football fields, affords a stunning contrast between the lifestyles appropriate in peace and war. On one side of the partition, you see the dining room, reconstructed to depict the peacetime table setting that was appropriate to the wealthy patrons of high culture for whom a dazzling array of knives and forks and spoons held no mysteries. On the other side of the partition, the evidences of wartime austerities are in sharp contrast. One metal tray with indentations replaces 15 plates and saucers. Bunks, not just double high, but eight tiers high, explain why the peacetime complement of 3,000 gave way to 15,000 people on board in wartime. How repugnant to the peacetime masters this transformation must have been. To do it took a national emergency, of course. 
the survival of a nation depended on it. The essence of the Great Commission today is that the survival of many millions of people depends on its fulfillment. And so he calls us to this wartime mentality, this, this, this single-mindedness of a soldier that's willing to give up luxuries, that's willing to strip aside anything that detracts from the mission at hand. And so Paul says to Timothy, be a teacher, be a discipler, and do that single-mindedly like a soldier. But then he continues. The, the image doesn't end there um, with, uh, with the image of a soldier, but we're called to be spiritual athletes. Look at verse 5. He says, similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. So here this image of suffering and enduring hardship continues, but specifically with athletes, he focuses on the importance of competing according to the rules. Um, I, I, that, can, that, that phrase can refer to the going according to the rules in the actual contest or in your preparation for it. And my guess is that Paul is alluding to something that would have been fairly well known in those days. Uh, for the Greek games, a rule required that athletes set aside 10 months in preparation for the games. And, and, and they would make an oath to Zeus that they would be, that their preparation was done properly and, and they could be punished if they lied. Uh, then as today, uh, it was important that athletes didn't cheat. Uh, either in the event or in the training that led up to it. And, and that temptation continues on to today. Thousands of people every year are tempted to break the rules and find some kind of shortcut to get the mission accomplished or to win. I'm not sure if you're familiar. In 1980, uh, Rosie Ruiz uh, won the Women's Boston Marathon uh, with the fastest time in Boston Marathon history. Except there were no pictures of her running. She wasn't spotted at any of the checkpoints throughout the race. When she finished, she wasn't breathing heavily and uh, appeared to have very little sweat um, on her. It was soon discovered that she jumped onto the course about a half mile from the end and uh, just read, ran the final half mile. And everyone's like, whoa, where'd, you know, this girl just broke this record and it was awesome. And within a few days, they kind of pieced everything uh, together. In the last 25 years, there, there's been tremendous pressure, not only in, in the events themselves, but particularly leading up to the events. Every athlete wants to find some way to have an edge. And so steroids and performance-enhancing performance drugs have become more prevalent. Bodybuilders, endurance athletes, baseball, basketball, football, you name it, there is someone who's been caught trying to use performance-enhancing drugs to find an edge. And these people that we admire and look up to, like Lance Armstrong, Mark McGuire, who've broken records and gained huge followings and endorsement deals, only to, to later have it revealed that they cheated. We're called to be soldiers, focused and willing to suffer, single-minded in our, in our task, and our mission, giving everything we have, but not cheating not taking shortcuts, not finding some way to bypass the work that's needed. We're called to be soldiers, but also athletes who compete according to the rules. What does this mean for us? Uh, one, it means that, that we can't bypass this need for discipleship. We, we, we can't jump around this. We can't create some programs that f take care of this for us so that we don't have to do this difficult work. Uh, the, the first book I ever read on uh, discipleship and making disciples uh, was a book by Leroy Imes, The Lost Art of Disciple Making. You can see this old version I got off of uh, uh, the internet. And uh, I appreciate his quote on this. He says, he says, The ministry is to be carried on by people, not programs. It is to be carried out by someone and not by something. Disciples cannot be mass-produced. We cannot drop people into a program and see disciples emerge at the end of the production line. It takes time to make disciples. It takes individual, personal attention. It takes hours of prayer for them. It takes patience and understanding to teach them how to get into the word of God for themselves, how to feed and nourish their souls, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, how to apply the word to their lives. And it takes being an example to them of all of the above. Oftentimes, People want programs, they want some formula, they want some simple 
replicable process. And, and usually they want those things to be executed by the staff. You know, let, let, let the pastors and the elders, they do the programs, they teach the classes, and hopefully at the end of it all, disciples will emerge. And uh, Paul doesn't want us to take shortcuts. Um, and, and even if we tried that, um, it wouldn't work. Disciples take time. It takes personal investment. I, I think there's all kinds of ways that, that churches, pastors, people are tempted to shortcut ministry. Um, faking miracles in evangelistic crusades, you know, kind of drum up some kind of big spectacle of things and, and, and gather a crowd that way. Uh, I've seen you know, manipulative emotional appeals with music usually to try to drum up some you know, stirring emotional moment that isn't grounded in truth and teaching, but just some uh, frenzied momentary excitement. I'm aware of some churches that have done these uh, baptism services where um, they, they kind of open it up for anyone who wants to be baptized that day, and then they have a bunch of people like planted within the church who are going to come up to start the momentum, who are not actually going to be baptized, but they're just kind of like pretending like they are so that other people follow suit, kind of like, you know, the guy who plays guitar in the street corner, and you start with a little bit of money in the guitar case so that others follow suit. You know, and I, there's all these kinds of things that we can do to try to manipulate and pull on heartstrings and drum up some kind of thing. Paul doesn't want us to take shortcuts. He doesn't want us to, to cheat in this process. In 1 Corinthians 2, uh, 1 to 5, he, he describes his own process. So it was for, with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I love Paul's description of himself because it sounds a lot like probably how you would feel if you did have to preach next Sunday. You know, like, I, I, don't, I don't have any, like, wise and persuasive words. I don't have some, like, big, flashy presentation. If I'm going to speak, it's going to be with great fear and trembling. It's going to be with nothing of me but an absolute demonstration of the Spirit's power. My only hope is that God shows up and does something. It's that kind of dependence that Paul maintained. It's that kind of dependence that he challenged on Timothy to not take shortcuts but to do the hard work of discipleship, even if it's scary, even if it's intimidating, even if it's overwhelming. And lastly, he says, to be like a farmer. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Farmers are hardworking, and I think that's the aspect of suffering that he dwells on with farmers. Uh, they're not lazy. You don't last as a lazy farmer. Like, there's no such thing as a lazy farmer who's at his job for more than a year or two. Like, you, they, they kind of weed themselves out of existence pretty quickly. Lazy farmers don't last. Um, from Iowa, I have seen firsthand, like, the, the daily grind and faithfulness. Like, the cow's got to be milked. Like, you just can't get around it. You know, it, things need to be watered and pruned. And if you just kick back and take it easy, like, chaos will erupt on your farm, whether it's with animals, whether it's with crops. They need to constantly be, they need constant work, constant tending, constant investment. And it's that kind of hard work that Timothy is called to. It's that kind of hard work that we are called to. But with all of these overwhelming callings, we are reminded that one, we have a supply in Christ Jesus, the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And number two, we have a prize. That prize is mentioned in all three of these metaphors. First, he says, endure hardship like a good soldier. No one's uh, serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. There's the prize. That our faithfulness means that God is pleased with us. We have a, a, a commanding officer, someone who has enlisted us into duty, and we have the privilege of putting a smile on his face with our faithfulness. Uh, secondly, as an athlete, we compete according to the rules in order to receive the victor's crown. 
which Paul describes in chapter four, verse eight, as he faces his own death. He says, now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul is looking forward to this moment where this crown, this wreath, is laid on his head by a father who's proud of him. He's looking forward to being in the very presence of Jesus Christ and that affirmation of a heavenly father who loves him. And lastly, with this hardworking farmer receiving a a share of the crops, um, some have have tried to argue because Paul makes a case elsewhere that that pastors... um, that, that but with, their, with their spiritual labor are entitled to some kind of material uh, compensation in order to be, so they don't have to have another full-time job, but they are freed to uh, serve the church. I don't think that's quite the point here. I think he's just saying how a farmer is another example of someone who is blessed at the end of the hard work. He's just simply reminding in all of these things, we give, we suffer, we sacrifice, but God will not leave us empty-handed when it's all said and done. As Jesus said, anyone who is given houses, land, mothers, fathers, children, whatever, for me and for the kingdom, no one will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this life and in the the life to come. We have that promise, that hope before us. So what are we doing? Are we single-minded like soldiers? Are we striving and straining like athletes competing according to the rules, not taking shortcuts? Are we farmers who are hard at work Or are we living a peacetime mentality, relaxing on the couch and waiting for someone else to do the work of ministry? Um, We are all a part of this process. Now let's pray together. Father God, we need your help. We need your, we need your grace. We thank you that we don't have to do this alone. We thank you that you have an ever- ready, never-ending supply of riches at Christ's expense available for us as we step out in faith to invest in people around us. God, I pray that you would lead us, that you would spark conversations, that you would make connections. God, that we wouldn't sit back, but that we would take initiative looking for people who can pour into us and people that we can pour into God, begin organically forming those relationships now and prepare us as as a church for, for a greater emphasis on this to come. Help us, we need it. In your name we pray, amen.